Good day and happy UN Charter Day. My name is Rachel Bowen Pittman and I am the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA. This program is being recorded. I would like to welcome you to this very special global engagement online series to recognize the creation of the United Nations Charter 75 years ago today. At this time, I am honored to welcome Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins, President and CEO of the UN Foundation, who will give introductory remarks for our keynote speaker, Ms. Amina Mohammed, UN Deputy Secretary General and Chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Group. Ambassador Cousins. Thank you so much, Rachel. Happy UN Charter Day to everybody, and it's wonderful to have you online. We the peoples of the United Nations. Those words at the start of the UN Charter resonate so powerfully today, as they did then. And it was because of grassroots movements like UNA USA that delegates from 50 countries convened in San Francisco 75 years ago today to sign the UN Charter, showcasing a global commitment to international cooperation, dialogue, and shared action for peace following the Second World War. As UNA members, you are continuing that legacy through your advocacy on US-UN relations, like the week of action you just completed, through your support for UN programs, your activations on the sustainable development goals in your local communities, and your participation in the UN 75 global consultations in all 50 states, Washington DC and Puerto Rico. Your passion, your dedication, and the actions you take on behalf of the United Nations every day is the reason we are so delighted that Her Excellency Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, will join you today. Because she gives you a run for your money when it comes to passion, dedication, and action. Amina Mohammed is the fifth Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, a role she has held for the last three years, and she is a force to be reckoned with. Amina has served at the highest levels of government in her home country, Nigeria, including serving minister, as Minister of Environment, where she led her country's efforts on climate and their efforts to protect the natural environment. She has advised presidents and secretaries general on critical aspects of poverty, public sector reform and development. And in her first UN role in 2012, she led the process that resulted in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, I led U.S. negotiations on the SDGs, and while they are goals that have many mothers, it is safe to say that we would not have the SDGs without the unflagging determination and passion that she brought to that task. She solved problems, she broke deadlocks, she pushed everyone for ambition, she put the fear of God into negotiators like me, and we are all in her debt for that. Well, it won't surprise you that the Deputy Secretary General has multiple degrees and numerous awards. She also has six children, one grandchild, and a legion of admirers of whom I am very proud to be one. Amina, it is just wonderful to have you join us and everyone online looks so forward to your remarks and reflections. And I'm pleased to turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and uh, a friend and a sister. Um, this is a really important day. Um, happy Charter Day to everyone. At 75, we have done an amazing amount. It is a day of celebration. And I'm so happy that we're able uh, to, to have a conversation um, with, uh, uh, with this group of, um, I would say, diehard believers in the United Nations. So thank you for bringing us together. Let me start by a quote. If we fail to use it, we shall betray all those who have died so that we might meet here in freedom and safety to create it. If we seek to use it selfishly, for the advantage of any one nation or any small group of nations, we shall be equally guilty of that betrayal. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the words of Harry Truman at the signing ceremony of the UN Charter exactly 75 years ago today. He was speaking, of course, about the newly founded United Nations. Against the backdrop of two devastating wars where the balance of power politics failed miserably in keeping the peace, and when the term Holocaust was introduced to describe the indescribable, the stakes were clear and almost self-evident to everyone. World leaders were united in their resolve to create a new system of nations that are united, cooperating for peace, development, and fundamental human rights. Over the past eight decades, the UN 
has been instrumental in preventing a third world war, in educating millions of children globally, in keeping local peace in many places, in protecting human rights, in reducing poverty on a massive scale, and in providing humanitarian aid and safe haven to millions more. And in the Sustainable Development Goals, the United Nations has set out a roadmap for the world we need by 2030. Today, that same multilateral system is under threat. Great power politics is on the rise again and hurting the multilateral approach. Nationalism, unilateralism, and intolerance are making a comeback, taking advantage of lost trust in institutions and leaders, of deeply rooted discriminatory attitudes, and a sense of fear for the future. It is increasingly harder to find global answers to global challenges. And as COVID-19 demonstrates, every time we fail to find solutions to global challenges, the most vulnerable people in our societies are hit the hardest. Women who continue to struggle under a system of privileges of men, parents and families on the brink of poverty, refugees, migrants, displaced persons, and many more who face frequent discrimination and marginalization. Our world today is confused. It's ill-prepared, it's in turmoil, and in desperate need of a common resolve as it was 75 years ago. In the SDGs and the Agenda 2030, we are already have our roadmap. But if we are indeed to recover better, if we are indeed to make this a decade of action, then we need to rethink the way we think, the way we work, the way we engage each other, and the way we solve problems together. The approach of 1945 will not work today. We, we, we of course still need leaders and governments that lead and show restraint, foresight and courage, but truly transformative change needs to come from the bottom up. Even before the killing of George Floyd, people across the world were rising up for a better future. People everywhere, especially young people, were standing up for the world, up for each other, for our global village, for the planet and future generations. They share a basic common resolve for justice, equal rights, political, social, and economic. Today's global challenges need civil society, the private sector, academia, and many other actors to work together with governments to find solutions. The United Nations, we, have perhaps never come quite close enough to the peoples of the Charter, and we need your help to bring us closer. To mark the 75th anniversary of the UN, we have launched the global conversation to listen to your voices to crowdsource answers to the big questions of our time. Our meeting today is part of that discussion. So were the many other UN 75 events that the UNA UNSA, USA has held across the country on the world we want and the UN that we need. Their priorities for action emerging from this conversation, your priorities, will be presented to world leaders in September for the UN 75th anniversary. And they will also serve as a unique source of information and inspiration as the UN seeks to meet global expectations and become the organization that our world so desperately needs. So in the words of Truman, let us not fail to use this opportunity. Thank you for listening and more importantly, I'm looking forward to listening to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mohammed, and thank you for your inspiring remarks. I know time is short, so I would like to ask you a couple questions before we move to the audience. And um, as you just mentioned, UNA USA conducted UN75 consultations across the United States. If you had been a participant in one of these consultations, how would you have answered UN Secretary General's question what kind of action is needed to help us create a brighter future? Wow, a difficult answer um, to give, but one that I would say would be the SDGs in short. Um, those 17 signposts all in the same direction to 2030 um, for me would be the most powerful response um, to what the UN needs to support us lift to achieve. Um, and each one of those goals is so integrated. I always say, whichever goal you choose that is yours, that is your favorite, the one that's more meaningful to you, becomes a docking station for all others. Uh, so if it's gender equality, you cannot see any other goal without that. 
Um, and so for me, I think it's, it, is the, it is the 17 goals. It took four years to shape them and craft them with the voices uh, of many, including young people um, in the United States of America. So I would say it would be the SDGs. <laughs> Great. And let's stick with uh, the SDGs. Uh, while there's been some progress in achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, we still have a long way to go and the COVID-19 pandemic has only stalled our progress. We know we must come together as a global community to push forward in order to achieve these goals. As we enter the decade of action, what are some lessons learned from the pandemic that could help us build back better and how can we leverage the SDGs to help create effective response plans to ensure we get back on track to achieve the 2030 agenda? Mm -hmm. Well, COVID for one did put a pause on the world. For the first time, we're faced to look at our own humanity and to see really how global and connected we are as, as a human race. I mean, I think that in itself was a big wake up call that whatever was happening here was happening everywhere else in the world. What it did further was to show us how, um, how many of the inequalities that we talked about, sometimes just referring to developing countries was something that was happening in the United States as well. So many of the issues that the SDGs speak to are truly global. Um, and for that, COVID presents us with an opportunity to rethink the way that we bring people into this agenda and that we tackle these very important issues, especially for the most vulnerable and those that are being left behind. I think we've never quite realized um, since uh, the event of COVID, how many people are left behind with a quality education, with food and nutrition, um, with health services, basic health services, which we would just sort of look to the South and say, well, Africa's the health systems that are weak and the people don't get health. But in fact, we saw that in very many countries um, around that we would, we would determine are developed. Um, so I think, I think here um, it is about taking the opportunity of this crisis, seeing the gaps and, and banding together um, with government, with the partnerships in civil society and trying to get that done. I had a recent conversation in the last couple of days with an amazing project here in New York, our host city, um, that we would, that were dealing with gender-based violence. And what was quite incredible was to see how they were able to migrate what was a person-to-person -person service um, online um, and still to take care, even while we see huge um, increases in gender-based violence. So this is all possible. Um, and I think that that's what COVID has shown us. It's also shown us that this is a future about young people. Young people have gone to the street to protest the things that they think should not be part um, of our history, of our humanity today, and are already making and setting in place the changes that will happen um, beyond COVID. Great, thank you. Um, at this time, a few individuals will ask their pre-submitted pre questions. And the first person we have is Himaja. She'll introduce herself and say her question. Thank you so much for your time, Deputy Secretary General. My name is Himajan Nagaretti and I'm from Massachusetts. To preface, the Secretary General, the World Health Organization, and civil society leaders globally have all affirmed that sexual and reproductive health care is essential and needs to be centered as such in the global COVID response. In fact, the pandemic is exacerbating the vulnerabilities of marginalized populations like sex workers, LGBTQ+, and indigenous populations potentially undoing decades of progress in achieving sustainable development goals on and related to health and gender equality. My question for you is, how is the UN system working with governments to ensure that people can continue to access quality sexual and reproductive health care, knowing that periods, pregnancies, contraceptive, and sexual health and other needs don't stop during a pandemic? Thank you very much for that question. Really important because when COVID came along, everybody just attended to COVID and they left some of the services. In fact, um, what happened, what we saw happening were resources being diverted to attend to COVID. So one of the things that we've done with our countries is to say to them, hold on, we have to keep existing surfaces, uh, services going. So to maternal health, to sexual reproductive health, um, all of those have to be maintained. If anything, we have to strengthen the systems to have that going in addition to what we have to do to COVID. Um, and that's being done in any of the uh, resources that we manage to leverage for governments to do. We make sure that in the policy, in the plans, in the investments that we do, that these are continued um, as part of the expenditures. 
more importantly is, is working with partners because as you have lockdown, many of those services are provided by civil society. And if you're locked down, how on earth do you do that? So trying to be a little bit more innovative by helping um, civil society engage, particularly young people with technology and to see how we can make sure we still keep those services going. Uh, so important, first of all, to keep reminding people, COVID doesn't mean you put a pause on everything else. You have to continue, take the opportunity that because we say everyone must get a service, that perhaps now we can get the scale and leave no one behind. Um, and at the end of it, still keep underscoring no discrimination and marginalization has to be out the door. Everyone must be included in the responses that we have. Thank you. The next person is London. Hello, Deputy Secretary General. My name is London Bell and I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And in your remarks to the Human Rights Council's emergency debate on racially inspired human rights violations, you said something that resonated with me personally and I quote, I have grown thick skin. And then you say, I feel the injustice of racial slurs in my human right to live a life of dignity and respect. How else have you persevered in a world that continuously inflicts discrimination and injustices against the black community? You know, um, until we had this recent protest, protest over the, the tragic um, killing um, of George Floyd, you know, we, we were all just living with this and trying to get through it. And it was a big wake up call to reflect on what are you using your office and your presence to do. I think in, instinctively, um, I make sure that people see me uh, for who I am and what I am with no apologies. And I think that that's really important. Uh, I find many people sort of trying to fall into that place of being invisible or perhaps um, uh, even, you know, uh, not afraid, but, you know, I, should, I shouldn't have to talk about this because it's not convenient. Well, absolutely it is. I am who I am and you must see me for who I am and I have no apologies. So that's the first thing is wherever you find yourself, stand tall, uh, chin up, shoulders back and lean in and lean in to do the work. The second is within the work that we do, providing the space to show the capacities and the strength in our diversity. And so everyone around the table, who's not there and why? If this is a, un if this is a United Nations that is rich in its diversity and that's what we preach to the world, then we must display that in the work that we do and the people that we are. And we're not perfect and we're still trying to get that right. Then you move to where the work matters most with our peacekeepers, with our humanitarian workers, with the work we do on development in countries. And you try there to do it through your work because it becomes a basic value that you carry into your work and the way you design your programs, you must do it with that lens of zero tolerance for any dis discrimination of, of, at all, that everyone is, you know, has equal rights. And, and so I would say that that's the way I try to tackle it is, is first of all, being very present um, and uh, you know, stand up for who and what I am, bring more people onto the table who's not in the room, who's not in the tent, and then really all the frustration and anger uh, that I feel I put into my work to get the job done because it's, you know, that gets you much further and you're surprised how much energy goes into it when you take the frustration off the streets into your work and you further it. Everyone has got a place um, in their journey of life where they can make a difference. And I think it's really important that you try to see that. It's sometimes we are not able in the UN to do what you can do in civil society, but together we can make huge impact and go so much further. So again, the partnerships in trying to get um, you know, zero discrimination in whatever form it comes um, and, and just participating from the inside out, from yourself, from your institution uh, and getting it done. Thank you. Next question is from Peter. Deputy Secretary General, thank you for joining us. I am Peter Caroon from the state of Utah, our Utah UNA chapter, and beautiful Salt Lake City, the host of the Civil Society Conference last year. Yes. My question is, what can we do to ensure that the United States remains an active and integral part of the United Nations system? So what can you do more? Because already the work that you do is incredible. And I think it's about deepening it and scaling it, um, that everyone understands what the charter is 
and how close it is to their own constitution. I always say it's not an additional layer on any constitutions embedded in most constitutions. The ideals and the values of the UN Charter are very much what we as human beings would like to see. So just making that connection that the Charter is not alien, it doesn't belong to that thing um, on First Avenue in New York or to a bunch of people we don't know. It belongs to humanity, to the world as it is represented. Um, uh, that's the first. I think the second is continuing to put fire under the feet of the representatives that you have here in the United Nations. Um, also, uh, to speak to you about the work of the United Nations. Um, I think the United Nations is an incredible place where not only are your representatives here, they have representatives of the rest of the world. So convening is what we do. How can we convene with you state by state, communicate community by community um, on issues that are um, pertinent and relevant at the time. I sometimes think we talk about issues that are very vague and they don't really come home to us. So how do we bring home uncomfortable conversations? Because not everything is, you know, uh, is, 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 uh, is bells and whistles. There are some very tough discussions and that's what the UN can do. Convening the right people around the table to have those kind of discussions. It doesn't have to be in New York. In fact, some of the best discussions we have are in our communities, are in town halls. Um, but it needs to be consistent. We need to build a movement of um, interaction, intergenerational conversation, um, and bring that to our representatives in the UN. Um, other representatives have, uh, have leverage over the UN. Um, the United States is a, is, an, is a critical partner. It's a very important partner. The leadership and where we are today with the UN would not have happened without the United States. Um, and a lot of what happens in your Congress matters here. So again, engaging and speaking with the Congress um, at the federal level, but also at the states. I've seen a lot of work that we've done together through this COVID um, experience um, with New York, um, and it's been incredible. I've seen a governor who's done things that are amazing and that we can learn from, uh, from a place where he came into uncharted waters. He didn't know which direction, nobody did, um, but you saw leadership. So anytime that we can get um, government, civil society, the people, communities, uh, to convene together about issues that affect uh, you in your daily life, uh, the wider implications of them, because sometimes I think we are um, individual and we have a right to be, but other times we need to also be collective. So in our individual and collective way, just leveraging in the United States the importance um, of your interaction, your shaping um, the world and its future. Thank you. Um, and I think we only have time for one more question. And um, I'm actually going to pull someone out um, because we have a lot of young people. So if Sarala can come on and ans ask your question. Hi, uh, my name is Sarala Morsupali. I am a member of UNA USA Minnesota. And my question to you is, what advice do you have for us younger generations in terms of being hopeful for a better future and how to actively be and remain involved? Um, great question. I mean, I think the first things first, keep yourself informed. Knowledge is power. Whatever it is that you gain in your education and the knowledge that you acquire, no one can take it away from you. Then you can use it. And then share it. Share it because you as a community, the largest cohort of young people exists today. So you are about the inter intergenerational transition we must have after UN at 75, after COVID. And so I think that young people today, with the knowledge they have, with the energy and foresight, with the digital world that we don't understand, but it's your world, um, that you can actually move forward quite quickly and shape it. I know that there is a lot of frustration uh, anxiety, what is the world going to look like? Someone explained to me the other day that young people see themselves at the bottom of Mount Everest. Um, they can see the top, but they can't see in between. And what I would say to young people is that it's the touch button. You know, if I touch a button, things happen. That life's not like that. Life's about a journey. And each step that you take in that journey, you have to make count because every step that you take strengthens you for the role and the leadership and the way you shape your life as you go forward. As a young person, if I was told my first job that I got in an architect's office was going to take me 11 years to reach the top, I'd have said I'm leaving after three months. But that's what it took. 
However, it's the work I did in those 11 years that enables me look at programs and projects at the granular level when I'm looking at the world today. So I, I'm here at the top of the 38th floor, but I also can see um, at the country level, at the local government level, what it means to take a policy decision here, because I took the journey step by step from the local level all the way through to finding myself in a position um, of great responsibility to try to make sense um, out of uh, the challenges that we have. So, you know, keep your eye on the journey, each step, put people at the center of it. It's really important to put people at the, cent at the center of it. Um, and, you know, always look left and right to see who you can pick up along the way um, as your companions. It's, those are important as well. Sometimes they drop off, but you know, you'll be amazed 15, 20 years later, it's those companions that you had that you will come back to in order to continue building um, in the path that, that, um, of, of the aspirations that you have. So knowledge, the journey, make it matter, putting people at the center um, and, and just remembering our humanity. Ms. Mohammed, I know you have a busy schedule on this UN Charter Day, so I wanna thank you for your leadership and spending time with us today. As the largest group of American advocates for United Nations, we will continue to engage our communities and political leaders on supporting the vital work of the UN. And please know that we are committed to upholding the ideals, values, and principles of the United Nations every single day for the next 75 years. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm very proud of the work you're doing. I'm proud to have you as partners, as friends, as colleagues, and uh, the journey continues. Uh, and this conversation, I will say, to be continued. So thank you so much. Thank you. So we're gonna move on to another part of the program. Uh, at the UN Foundation, we're privileged to have hundreds of thousands of young people taking a stand with us for global progress. Every day, they challenge world leaders to stand up for the values of, of the UN Charter. Leading up to Charter Day, we asked them to share their ideas for climate action during a period, during and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. From Ghana to Lebanon to Poland, and right here in the United States with our very own youth observer to the UN, Jalen Boone, these are the ideas for how the world can build back better. Dear global leaders, going back to normal is not what we want. The way we lived before the pandemic was not sustainable, and radical changes must be implemented. Environmental racism is real. People of color are much more likely to live near polluters as well as breathe polluted air. We must invest in renewable energies and divest from fossil fuels. We must prioritize resiliency of our climate and of our environment over short-term profit. It's time for our businesses to be held accountable for their impact on the planet. It's important that as young people like myself continue to advocate on the streets for climate change that our world leaders meet us halfway. We have a choice. Business as usual or building a more sustainable world. Because there is no planet B. Time, I'm so excited to bring you our closing presentation. A native of Centerville, Iowa, Simon Estes is one of the world's greatest bass baritone opera singers. The grandson of a slave, the son of a coal miner, Dr. Estes was part of the first generation of black opera singers to achieve widespread success and is viewed as part of a group of performers that was instrumental in helping break down the barriers of racial prejudice in the opera world. He has sung at most of the world's major opera houses, as well as in front of presidents, popes, and international renowned figures, such as Nelson Mandela, President Obama, and Desmond Tutu. Beyond his celebrated opera career, Dr. Estes has created a lasting legacy through his, man through his humanitarian work. Through his foundation, he provided hundreds of scholarships and educational financial assistance to children throughout his home state of Iowa and around the world. While performing at the World Cup in South Africa in 2010, Dr. Estes learned that a child was dying from malaria every 30 seconds. This experience inspired him to embark on a mission to partner with the U United Nations Foundation's Nothing But Nets campaign to protect children from malaria. Simon raised more than $500,000 
through events, concert tickets, and CD sales towards his $1 million goal. In 2017, UNF honored Dr. Estes with a Lifetime Impact Award, and he's been an incredible champion ambassador with Nothing But Nets. Simon performed at the UN's 25th and 50th anniversary events, and we're so grateful that he's able to participate in this event in honor of the UN's 75th anniversary. Today, Simon will perform pieces from You'll Never Walk Alone by Hammerstein in the traditional African-American spiritual He's got the whole world in his hands. Simon? And Simon, we'll have you take off your video and you'll unmute yourself. I should be on with unmuted. Yep, I can hear you. There you are. Thank you, Simon. Yes, thank you. Do I start to sing yes. now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, goodness. Different. Just a moment. I thought I was going to be on for another 20 minutes, but my wife's going to bring my pitch pipe to me. Anyhow, I would like to sing You'll Never Walk Alone. And the reason I've chosen this song is because we all need to help one another in the world today. And we'll, I want people to know that we'll, we'll have, we will not have to feel as though we are alone. And the other song I'm going to sing is He's Got the Whole World in His Hand. That was Martin Luther King's favorite song. And after he died, I always sang that as an encore uh, in honor of Martin Luther King. So I'll put my... Okay, thank you. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high, and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of a storm is a golden sky, and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. And now I will sing, he's got the whole world in his hand. 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 He's got the woods and the waters in his hand. He's got the woods and the waters in his hand. He's got the sun and the moon right in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got you and me right in his hand. He's got you and me right in his hand. He's got everybody in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. Amen. Thank you so much, Simon, for that inspiring and wonderful performance. I appreciate the time that you've given us and um, have really moved us uh, on this special day uh, in celebration of the UN. So thank you. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Thank God you. bless you, too.
So in closing this program, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, today's event and our global engagement online series is a year long program that gives you access to unique discussions with global issues experts. So I hope you can join us for upcoming programs in the coming weeks. And you can do this by texting GEOS, G -E -O -S, to 738-674 for more information, or you can go to our website, unausa.org. And also, I would be remiss if I don't encourage you um, to join UNA USA. Um, we are proud that we are, as an organization, have over 20,000 members and more than 200 chapters throughout the United States. Um, we provide opportunities for people to engage in civic action to address issues such as global health, racial injustice, education, climate change, gender equality, and so much more to engage and work uh, throughout um, our communities to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And as the United Nations Association of the USA, we are the only organization whose sole mission is to support and advocate for the United Nations. So I invite you to be a part of this great civic action by joining UNA USA at unausa.org. Thank you all once again for participating in today's GEOS program. I welcome your engagement in UNA USA and your support for the United Nations and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I hope you have a safe uh, and I hope you stay safe and stay well and leave today's program inspired to make our world safer, healthier, and more just for all peoples. Thank you. <laughs>